Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We're now on the prohibitions of ihram. Now that you have entered your state of ihram, certain things will become haram for you, all of you, men and women. My laser there. Okay. Men cannot wear sewn clothes such as a shirt, turban, hooded cloak. Trousers, underwear, socks and shoes. Men are not allowed to wear clothes that are sewn. What is forbidden is not stitched, stitched material. Right? It's hard to find material that will not have any stitches on it. Okay? Even your ihram sheets will have stitches somewhere. Okay? So that's not what is forbidden. What is forbidden is that garments made to fit the limbs. Okay, these are forbidden, such as shirts, jackets, t-shirts, etc. They're made to fit your limbs. They're shaped in such a way that they fit your limb, parts of your body. That is forbidden. Men cannot wear gloves, although there's no harm in wrapping the ha hands in cloth if, you, if there is a need. The need arises for men to wrap their hands with the, with, the, with the garment, with a towel or something. That is allowed, but you're not allowed to wear gloves. Men, we're talking about men here. Men cannot cover their head. But they may take a shade under an umbrella. You can use an umbrella to take shade, but you cannot use like a rumal to, to cover your head once you're out in the sun, going to the masjid, coming from the masjid and so on, in a state of ihram. You can use an umbrella, that's fine. Women can wear the normal clothes, but without covering their faces, except as mentioned previously, uh, gloves are also permitted for women, but not advisable. In a state of ihram, best not to wear gloves for women, but if they do wear it, then it, it is okay. But if, if, it, uh, if uh, avoidable, try to not to wear your gloves. Sent in hot towels, refresher tissues, liquid soap on the plane should be avoided. Right? You have to be very careful. A lot of people make this mistake. We had some brothers go from here recently, uh, and on the plane, they were already in a state of ihram, and then on the plane, one of the brothers went to the toilet, uh, he, uh, he did what he needed to do in the toilet and then he used the soap dispenser and he washed his hands, both his hands with the soap. He came out and then he realized, I'm in, in a state of ihram and the soap is scented. The soap has a fragrance in it. Uh, so in that case, uh, he ended up eventually uh, giving a dumb. He, over there he had to uh, sacrifice an animal which nowadays is quite expensive, especially with the uh, value of the pound dropping. It's much more expensive than before. Okay, so make sure you do not use, in a state of ihram, men and women, you do not use anything that has a fragrance on it. There will be more uh, later on on this. On the, on the plane when they uh, give you those refresher towels, refresher tissues rather, in the small packets, after you've had your uh, dinner on the plane, you'll have these refresher wet tissues that you take after the packet. Uh, they have a scent on them. You should not be using them on the plane. You should not be using the soap on the plane. Uh, one thing that you can do, everyone, is um, every year I uh, uh, suggest this to the hajjis during the hajj lessons, that you can nowadays find uh, non-fragranced uh, soap in the shops. You have to look for them, but there are soap in the shops which have absolutely no fragrance at all. Okay, There's no fragrance, there's no scent on the soap, not even the soap's not, uh, usual scent. These are available, take those with you. Uh, you will need them in a state of ihram. But if you can last uh, your state of ihram without any soap at all, then, then be it. But I think if you're using the toilet, then Islamically uh, speaking, and also hygiene, hygiene, in terms of hygiene, personal hygiene, you need to use some soap after using the toilet. So best to get one of those soaps from the shops. Uh, another prohibition of ihram is applying perfume to the body or clothing. Uh, there is no harm in what remains of the perfume used prior to ihram on the body or clothing, as was explained before. It is permitted to change into new clothes or sheets during the ihram, but they should not be scented, otherwise it will incur a penalty. Uh, so if you have used your ihram sheets and then they've got wet, they've got dirty, uh, or they're smelly, they're dusty, you can change. Uh, you can take these off, and you can change into a new uh, set of sheets, or just a new sheet if you wanted to. So you can go into the bathroom, you can take them off, and then you can wear new sheets. But don't take these off, and in in changing into your new sheets, you put your lungi on. Uh, doing uh, Hajj the last time uh, in our Hajj, uh, someone in our group um, went into the bathroom, and then they changed into their lungi, came back to the room, and they were sat in the room wearing their lungi in a state of ihram for Hajj. 
And then I, I said, are you not in Ihram? Because at that time everyone was still in Ihram during the main days of Hajj. And then they had to rush back into the bathroom, put there, and then I had to research to see what penalty that would incur. So make sure you do that. You don't do that, rather. Scented soap, toothpaste, mouthwash, etc. are not allowed. Toothpaste, mouthwash, all these have scents. You cannot use those. Likewise with food. Scented food and drink. Food and drink that, has, that have scent, fragrance. Uh, for example, minty flavor, saffron, vanilla, rose essence. These are not allowed to, in a state of ihram. Intercourse and anything leading to it, uh, such as these being mentioned here, all of these gestures, uh, explicit chat, etc. with your spouse, all of this is completely haram in a state of ihram. This may be rewardable at other times, you get thaw up for it, but in a state of ihram, it's a violation of your ihram. Violation of the sanctity of your ihram. It becomes completely haram. Even gestures, hints, etc. becomes haram. It's more of a problem during Hajj because the duration of your ihram is much longer during Hajj. It becomes a challenge for certain people. But during Umrah it shouldn't be a problem, inshallah, because your, the time you will spend in your state of ihram is very brief, relatively. Removing hair from any part of the body is also haram, prohibited in a state of ihram. Clipping your nails is haram. So basically removing anything from your body is haram in a state of ihram. Killing of lice, if you have lice on your head lice, or any other lice, or any other animals, uh, is also haram in a state of ihram, except harmful ones such as mice, snakes and scorpions. So if there's a snake comes into your room in your hotel, or there's a, a, a mouse or a rat that may bite you during the night, uh, you can kill that in a state of ihram. Anything that is harmful may be killed, but head lice etc. are not, you're not allowed to kill them. Although you may argue they're also harmful because they're sucking my blood all the time. But you'll have to just do sabr until you exit your ihram and then you can fight them. Right. Permissible things in, a, in your state of ihram. These things are permissible. Now some of these things may surprise you. You may think they were haram in a state of ihram, but they are not. Using an umbrella in a state of ihram. You can, although you're not allowed, men are not allowed to cover their head in a state of ihram, but they may use an umbrella. Because the umbrella, you're not wearing the umbrella. It's an external, uh, separate thing. That is allowed. The roof of a car or tent for shade. You can, if you use the roof of a car, you use the tent for shade. All of that is allowed. should be obvious. Carrying your baggage atop your head. Holding your bag on your head is allowed. Or carrying a backpack. Wearing stitched sandals that do not cover the metatarsal or ankles, the bone that I showed you, the, the, is the central bone on the top of your foot. Uh, but as long as that is left exposed open, then you can wear sandals. If you want, uh, brothers, if you want to buy your sandals or go to the shop, take photos of sandals and send them to my phone to, to check and I can tell you whether that is allowed or not. Wearing a stitched belt to keep money safe or hold up your ihram. Okay, that is fine. If your belt has some stitching, that's fine. Wearing a tubular woven sheets for the lower body, as I explained, mentioned to you before, uh, some of these ihram sheets are now made. They are not very common yet in the market, but they're like a tube. Okay, uh, those are allowed. Wearing a ring or watch on your wrist or around your neck, that is allowed. Watch, watch, watch is, uh, most jewelry is allowed in the state of ihram. Wearing eyeglasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, or hearing aid, these are all allowed. Uh, cleansing yourself with unscented cleansers. If you clean yourself, wet wipes, etc. As long as there's no scent on it, there are baby wipes or wipes that are allowed in the supermarkets that do not have any scent at all. Those are allowed. Washing or scratching your head and body. Uh, if you have to scratch your body, your head, that is allowed. But make sure that your scratching does not remove any hair. By scratching your head or scratching your body, you're, you don't remove any hair from your body. And give some sadaqa if a few strands of hair fall unintentionally. Washing your haram garments or putting on new unscented ones. Okay, that's allowed. If you need to change your ihram garments, you're in, you are in a state of ihram and you need to change your ihram sheets or ihram clothing. In the, uh, in the case of a, a woman, you can change your clothes, you can wash your clothes, but what must you not do when washing? You must not use soap powder, washing powder that has a scent. Most washing powders will have some sort of fragrance on it. So make sure, uh, best to avoid it. Don't wash it, just leave it uh, to one side until you've exited your state of ihram. Alright.
how to perform your umrah now. So if you recall, I said to you at the beginning that there are just four parts to your, uh, to your uh, umrah. There are four elements of your umrah. Two of those elements are fard and two elements are wajib and that constitutes your, uh, your umrah. So this, these are the details now. So the first uh, element, uh, the first fard out of the two. The first one is to enter your state of ihram by making the intention and saying the talbiyah. Uh, so remember everyone that your ihram does not mean just wearing your sheets or your clothing, your garments for ihram. That does not mean ihram. Although these two sheets are generally referred to as ihram. People will say, have you, have you bought your ihram yet? Ihram, ihram means a state. It means a state. Halat. It does not mean any, any clothing, any items. Ihram means a state, a condition. So ihram means to enter that state whereby, in English it's uh, pilgrim sanctity, to enter the state of pilgrim sanctity, that's called ihram. And that is not, you're not in a state of ihram until and unless you've made the intention. You have to make the intention, otherwise your ihram is not valid. Even if you do not pray the two rakat, your ihram is valid as long as you make the intention. When you say that talbiya labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik bil umrati labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. And while saying that, or after saying that you made the intention in your mind that I have now entered my state of ihram for umrah, that's when you become a muhrim, that is when you are now in a, when you are in a state of ihram. So ihram, Making ihram entails making the intention and saying the talbiya. Intention in your mind or expressing it verbally is good, recommended, and saying the talbiya. And praying two rakat, which is sunnah. The second thing, which is fard, out of the two further elements of your umrah, is doing the tawaf of the Kaaba with the intention of tawaf, which inshallah we shall look at in detail shortly. The two fard elements of your umrah, the two, rather, sorry, wajib elements of your umrah. Just hand them up. Put your hand up those who do not have this book list. The two wajib elements of your umrah are, first of all, to do sa'i between Safa and Marwa. Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. We shall look at this in detail later. And the second wajib element is to shave your head, which is called halq in Arabic, or to trim, which is called qasr or taqsir of approximately one inch of hair from 25% of your entire hair. 25% of your head, rather. 25% of the hair on your head. If a person does not have all the hair that he once upon a time had on his hair, then you have to look at the full surface, what he had originally, before he became bald or he lost a lot of his hair. 25% of that hair has got to be cut uh, by an inch. Approximately an inch. Inshallah, we'll come to that later on. So these are the four things that you do. You need to do for your umrah, and that's it. You perform your umrah. Four things, two of which are fard, ihram, and tawaf of the house of Allah, and two are wajib, sa'i between safa and marwa, and shaving or cutting of the hair. When you've reached Makkah, now you're going for umrah. When you've reached Makkah, you check into your hotel. And best thing to do, I would recommend, is that you take some rest. Okay, you you will be completely exhausted, fatigued by the journey from here, from the UK, transit. If there was a transit on the way, and then you get to your hotel in Makkah, get to Jeddah, where you do um, the customs, etc., immigration customs at Jeddah airport, which may take a long time. Uh, it's very unpredictable. They're not as efficient and as smooth running uh, as UK airports. Okay, they sometimes can. Uh, uh, really get on your nerves but you need to have sabr don't argue with them because they will not respond very nicely if you argue or, or if you do their, their um, culture and mannerisms are much different to English people okay so you need to have sabr if they if you think they're wasting your time you're in the queue and he's having uh, a chat with his mate he's playing on his phone behind the counter don't argue with him just let him do what he's doing just stand there wait for him to notice that you're standing patiently and then he will try and help you and then from there, you will find a vehicle to take you to Makkah Mukarramah. You will locate your hotel, and then you'll get to your hotel. And I would recommend that you take some rest, ensuring that you do not do anything that is prohibited in the state of Ihram. Take some rest. If you need to um, uh, eat, eat. 
and uh, take some rest. You would have, by that time, you would have sweated really badly because as soon as you get to outside the airport, uh, then uh, it will feel, for first time, as it will feel like you've just entered a, a, a mega, a giant oven. As soon as you step out of the airport building, uh, suddenly 35, 37, 38 degrees Celsius hits you and it's like you've walked into a, 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 an oven. That's what it literally feels like. So that from then on you will start sweating, non-stop sweating. So you'll be doing ghusl in your sweat all the time when you're outside. So when you get to your hotel, try and have a shower, a quick shower. Don't use any soap, don't rub your body. Just have a shower to, to get rid of the sweat uh, gently and then get out of your shower. Have something to eat if you need to eat and then uh, once you've rested and you feel refreshed, you've got the energy, now you're going to go for your Umrah. And make sure you have the energy. Don't just go and... Uh, because this is the whole point. The whole point of your journey is to do, go and perform this Umrah. So make sure you're fully ready for it. You're prepared for it. You're refreshed. Uh, you're re-energized before... Refueled before you go for it. Don't just go and rush to go and do it and get over and done with. Okay, that's what shaitan tries to do with you. During Hajj and during Umrah, shaitan always make, tries to make you hasty. So that you do things quickly. But where are you going to go? After you've hastily done your Umrah, then you're not going to go anywhere. You're still going to be there for the two weeks or so that you're going to be there for. So don't be hasty. Take your time. You go and enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram while uh, chanting your Talbiyah Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Preferably through a, uh, a gate or door entrance known as Babu Salam with the right foot first. But nowadays, uh, due to convenience, most people uh, would be entering from the big entrance known as the King Abdul Aziz Gate. Nowadays, people go through there. If you can locate Babu Salam, it's best to enter the masjid through Babu Salam. Whilst you, when you enter the masjid, I'll show you uh, some images, a bird's eye view of Al Masjid Al Haram. Uh, and you can uh, gauge how uh, huge the, the, the masjid complex is. When you've entered the masjid, you should keep looking down. Keep your gaze down. Don't let your eyes stray and wander around looking at the chandeliers and the calligraphy and the beauty of the masjid. Keep your eyes down and you walk towards the middle where you know in the, in the middle center of the masjid, uh, the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is situated. So you keep looking down whilst you're walking until you find a place from where you can see the Kaaba. Find the location from where you see the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you stand comfortably without disturbing others to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do dua. Any dua that is made at this time, any dua that you do now is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you should make sure that you do dua uh, with, with your heart, your mind, your soul, uh, and cry your eyes out. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Ask Him for all the good things of this dunya and all the good things of the akhirah. This is the time to do dua when you first see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's an image there uh, from possibly a helicopter uh, of, the, of Al-Masjid Al-Haram as it is today. That's a closer view of the masjid. Uh, generally, people will be entering the masjid from this side. Okay, from there, because most of the hotels uh, uh, are located this way, this way. So generally, people will be entering from any of these. Uh, the King Abdul Aziz Gate uh, is is there, and I think this big one here is the King Fahad Gate, uh, the main entrance. So people will be entering through there generally, and they you you walk uh, towards the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It looks very small on the on the photo here, the image. But when you get to the real place, it is a very, very huge place. That is showing you the house, the Kaaba, with all the various uh, locations, key locations within the vicinity. Okay, we shall come back to that later, inshallah. That's another bird's eye view from the top of Al Masjid Al Haram. And that's showing you that is the Babu Salam that I mentioned to you. The Salam Gate of Babu Salam. But Babu Salam is at the rear of the Masjid. Uh, and the King Fahd Gate is the big gate that you usually see, uh, and that's there. And the King Abdul Aziz Gate is that way. So most people enter and exit the masjid through these, these gates at the front. So you've now entered the masjid, you're about to begin your Umrah. 
The first thing that you have to do out of your four things of Umrah is to do the Tawaf. Now, Idtiba that I mentioned to you before, Idtiba is only for men. And Idtiba means for men to wear your upper sheet, the upper sheet in such a way that your right shoulder, that the upper sheet of the Ihram passes from underneath your right arm and you put it over the left shoulder bearing your, 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 your right shoulder. So you wear it like this in, in a way that it passes under your right arm, it goes over your left shoulder and your right shoulder is left exposed. That is called Idtiba in men, when in the state of Ihram. You enter the Mataf, the Mataf means the Tawaf area. You enter the Tawaf area and also you must make sure that you have to be in a state of Wudu for Tawaf. You have to have Wudu for your Tawaf. Okay? So make sure you're in a state of Wudu for your Tawaf. For the duration of your Tawaf, you must be in a state of Wudu. And then now you stop saying the Talbiyah, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik must be stopped. You stop saying that once you reach the black stone, Al Hajar Al Aswad. And this is where, from where you shall start your Tawaf. Okay, so if we go back, I can show you. Uh, Alright, look, this is the Kaaba. That corner there is the black stone, Al Hajar Al Aswad. This is the black stone there, and then there's the door of the Kaaba there, and then that corner of the house is called uh, Ar Ruknul Iraqi, the Iraqi corner. Basically, because Iraq is in that direction. So, in the olden days, the people uh, they, they gave names to each of the corners based on the direction of the country that lies there. So, uh, that's what is historically that corner has been referred to by the Arabs as the Iraqi corner. This uh, corner is known as Ar-Rukn shami the Shami corner, the Syrian corner, because Syria is in that direction. Ar-Rukn yamani the Yemeni corner, because Yemen is in this direction. So each of these three corners of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a, a nickname, a name. And this corner is where the, uh, does not have a name, that's where the Al-Hajr al-Aswad is located, the black stone is located. So the black stone, and next to the black stone on, this, on the wall, you will find the door of the Kaaba, and then the Iraqi corner, Rukn al-Iraqi. And then here you have what is, no, what is known as the Hijr. The Hijr of Ismail salam, also referred to as the Hatim. This semicircular wall, which you, those who have been before have seen and the rest of us have seen uh, on our computers and, and screens. Uh, this is a semicircular wall that denotes the old Kaaba. The Kaaba used to be all the way to there. That's how big the Kaaba was. And then, if you know the story, during the, uh, the prayer to prophethood of our Prophet wasallam, the Kaaba was rebuilt. And the, one of the conditions when they raised the money, the Quraysh raised the money, one of the conditions they set for donations towards the rebuilding of the Kaaba was that all the money donated should be 100% halal. So the Quraysh were such people that they did not have 100% halal money in the community in Makkah Mukarramah, enough to, for the bricks and for the bricks and mortar to rebuild the house as it was before. So they left that much. So that that has been today. Uh, we have this wall here, semicircular wall known as the Hatim or the Hijr, and that tells you that this is where the Kaaba used to extend. When you do Tawaf, make sure you always go around this wall the semicircular wall, the Hatim. Otherwise, if you try to take a shortcut through there, that will be considered to be going through the Kaaba. If you have cut through the Kaaba, your Ta'af is incomplete. So don't, even if you get the chance to uh, then resist the temptation of slipping through and then slipping out this way. Alright, so if you get back now. Um, again, this, where the black stone is, this is where you will begin your Ta'af from Standing parallel with the black stone, try to have the black stone towards your right, facing the black stone. This is where you shall begin your tawaf, and then you shall go around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seven times. Each, once you, once you get all the way, uh, go all the way around and come back to the black stone, that is, that is one circuit, one short, one circuit. 
you need to do seven such circuits in order for your ta'af to be complete. Seven circuits, starting from the black stone and ending at the black stone, details of which inshallah shall follow. There used to be a black belt on the floor. They, they, that may exist, may not exist now. Sometimes it's there, sometimes they remove it, I don't know. But you know, uh, the, the easy way to know that you are parallel with the black stone is that at this end of the masjid wall, you will find a, a long green light, a very bright green light which you cannot miss. If you look this way, away from the house, from the black stone, where the wall of the uh, masjid uh, complex begins, you will see there's a long green light, big light that you cannot miss. That has been placed there deliberately for people to, to help people um, place themselves in line with the black stone before beginning their ta'af and, uh, and ending their ta'af. So you do, you're, you're wearing your ta'af uh, upper sheet for men in the, doing idtiba, and then you go into the ta'af area in the state of wudu, and when you reach the black stone, you stop your talbiyah because that is your starting point of your ta'af. You make the intention now, the intention for ta'af. You've already made the intention for umrah at the beginning when you uh, enter the state of ihram. Now you make the intention of your ta'af. You stand in front of the Kaaba facing the black stone in such a way that the whole uh, black stone is on your right side. Okay? The black stone is to your, towards your right side. And without raising your hands, you make the intention. So you can make the intention in your own language. In English, you can say, oh Allah, I, I, I'm about to perform tawaf of Umrah to please you. Make it easy for me and accept it from me. Make, make that intention. You will now raise both your hands, your palms towards the black stone and you will say the takbir. Alright, so when you're facing the black stone, in, in order to start your tawaf, you must make sure that the black stone is to you, towards your right. So, you know, in order to make sure that you don't start your tawaf beyond the mark, start mark. So, just to be on the safe side, if you stand there like this, then the black stone is to, slightly to your right. So, basically what you're doing is you're starting your tawaf before the start mark. Just to ensure that you start your tawaf before the start mark. Does that make sense? So yes? The line here, yeah. the, 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 let's say this corner, yeah? I've got the line here. So I have to stand here so that this is on my right. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing also you have to make sure is uh, throughout your ta'af, the house of Allah, the Kaaba must always be to your left. If you walk even a small distance with your back towards the house, or your right towards the house, or your face, you're facing the house, then that much of your tawaf, that much distance is considered to be not part of your tawaf. Which means at the end of it, your tawaf will remain incomplete. You must not have, you should, at all times during your tawaf, you must make sure the house is towards your left. You should not face the house, rather, during your tawaf, to look at the house is makru. During your tawaf, to look at the Kaaba is makru. It's disliked, it's disrespectful to the house. After your ta'af, you can stare at the house. The more you look at the house of Allah, the more rewarded, inshallah, you will be. But during ta'af, it's the opposite. You should not look at the house during your ta'af. Um, so, so uh, you start your ta'af in this manner. You raise both your palms like this towards the black stone and you say the takbir, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd. And then you drop your hands and you point your palms towards the black stone and kiss them. Okay, like this. If you can reach the stone, then you don't do all of this. This is called istilam. If you can actually physically reach the stone, then you, you start your ta'af by kissing the stone. And then you start your ta'af. But that may not be possible. Depending nowadays, throughout the year, it's more or less always impossible. It depends. But if you're, if you're performing your ta'af at a very quiet time of the night, for example, you may be lucky to go and kiss, physically actually kiss this black stone and then begin your ta'af from there. So if that is not possible to kiss the stone, actually kissing the stone, then you should raise your, point your palms towards the black stone and kiss your palms like this. You do this when you are unable to kiss the black stone and this is called istilam. Every time you have to kiss the black stone, 
as inshallah I shall describe uh, if it's not possible to physically go to the stone reach it touch it and kiss it you should just point your palms towards it and kiss your palms if someone stops you and says say, say bid'a bid'a you can just ignore that it may be a bid'a to him but this is how we do it in our, in our mother okay that image there is showing you some of the key locations uh, within the center of the masjid, okay, the black stone, the door of the Kaaba, Hijr Ismail the Hatim, Maqam Ibrahim, which inshallah I should show you later on. Uh, the Zamzam used to be the, the actual uh, well of the Zamzam is at this location, okay, under the, the Mataf uh, surface of floor. That was closed in 2004. That no longer exists. That has been completely blocked off. It's now uh, completely, it doesn't, it's not there. It is, it does exist. The well is there, but uh, you will not be able to reach it. But uh, instead, uh, there are taps all over and also water dispensers everywhere which contain just some some water. So as long as you drink from them, you are drinking some some water. The Hatim and the Rukun Yamani. <coughs> So you've, done, you've started your ta'af now. Okay, going back to your ta'af. You've now started your ta'af. The Rukun Yamani, a Rukmul Yamani, after passing the three corners of the Kaaba, so you started from the black stone, then you came to one corner, then you came to another corner, and then you came, you come to the third corner, the corner that is just before you get to the corner which houses the black stone. That third corner is called a Rukmul Yamani, or the Yemeni corner. On this corner, there are things, some things that you have to do when you reach that fourth corner, the corner before you get back to the black stone corner. Touch it with both hands or with the right hand if you can. And you will notice that that corner of the house is polished. It's very polished. It's not the normal brickwork of the, of the Kaaba. You will see it's all very polished, very smooth. That corner is very smooth and you'll always see a crowd of people trying to get to it. You will notice it, you can't miss it because there will be people crowding around it all the time. You need to touch it. You need to touch it with both hands or if that is impossible then you can just use one hand and, 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 and touch it. And you say the dua. So from that corner... <coughs> yeah. From that corner, from that corner all the way to the black stone, uh, you must make sh you should try and say this to Arabana Atina Fidunya Hasanata wa fil Ahirati Hasanata wa kina Zabanad. You keep repeating this to which is from the Quran, Rabbana Atina Fidunya Hasanata wa fil Ahirati Hasanata wa kina Zabanad until you reach the next corner which is the black stone. That will complete one circuit of your ta'af, one shout. Another point which I was going to mention later but is prompted me is that be careful throughout your ta'af and in a state of ihram uh, the house and the cloth that covers it uh, the, the brickwork everything usually is very heavily scented a lot of expensive perfume is is washed on is, is splashed on it right so if you in a state of ihram touch the wall or the 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 cover of the kaaba then you are bound to get this very strong perfume on your hands in a state of ihram so therefore be careful when you do all of this I've told you what the Hatim is. The Hatim originally used to be a part of the Kaaba, that semicircular wall there that you can see there. They sometimes allow people to get in and at other times, times there will, they will be police uh, officers or soldiers who will keep the entrance, is, both entrances blocked. They won't allow people to go. But uh, sometimes, as generally it's open, people, but you'll always see people will be pushing and shoving to get in because if you can get in there like these guys there are doing, and if you can pray inside there, that will be considered to, you will be considered to have prayed inside the Kaaba. Because that is, the original Kaaba was up to there. That's why you'll always see a lot of people crowding and pushing to get in there. And those who manage to get in there, they more or less pray on each other's back. That's how, how they stand in there. If you try to do it, but at all times, make sure you do not cause any harm to any person. Any form of taklif, hardship, inconvenience, harm should be avoided at all times because that is haram. To pray in there, to kiss the black stone, all of these things are mustahab. They're desirable, rewardable. However, to cause any form of harm to a person, be it physical or psychological, is haram. So you must be very careful that you do not do that. This was originally, originally part of the Kaaba and it was not included in the main structure when the Quraysh rebuilt it. It is obligatory to go around the Hatim and not through it when performing your, your Tawaf. When you reach the black stone, so you've, you've done one circuit, you've come back to the black stone, 
you have completed one circuit. Okay, the other thing, when you're doing your tawaf, there's no specific dua that you should say. Okay, I'll come on to this inshallah uh, later on. You can do any dua as you're doing the tawaf, any dua from the Quran and Sunnah. Or you can even do dua in your own language. You can make up dua, uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things that you want for, uh, uh, for, your, for your worldly life as well as your life hereafter. You can do any dua. Recitation of the Quran during tawaf and sa'i between Safa and Marwa uh, is allowed, but it is better to do engage in dua. When you're doing tawaf around the house and when you're doing sa'i between Safa and Marwa 7, it is, although recitation of the Quran is allowed, but it is better during these two times to do dua instead of recitation of the Quran. Now you start the second circuit by kissing the black stone or pointing towards it, doing istilam as mentioned before, as you did the first time. While standing there and saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd. You will always see that at that point, when people near to the black stone, you will always see that there are people crowding there. People will be crowding, and you will see police uh, officers uh, or soldiers during uh, peak seasons, you will see they will be pushing people away, not to stand there for long. So quickly, within a second or two, just do that. You can, it literally takes two seconds. Once you know you're parallel with the black stone, raise your hands, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd, kiss your palms and then move on. Don't stand there and try to engage in a long dua, munajat. Okay? That's inadvisable and that's being stupid because you will see that you're causing inconvenience to a lot of people by doing that. Go around the dua six more times as you did before uh, to complete your seven circuits around the house and that will complete your tawaf. Some points that you need to know men for your tawaf. The first three circuits for men that you will do around the house out of the seven. Seven circuits around the house uh, make your full uh, tawaf. For the first three circuits of your tawaf, you must walk briskly in short steps, okay, while gently, gently shaking the sho so shoulders like a soldier. For the first three circuits, men, you must make sure that you're walking like a warrior, like this, not like a wimp. <laughs> right. uh, normally, we're commanded to be very humble. You keep your chest down, you keep your shoulders down, you keep your head down. You, you're, a Muslim is always humble, but at that time, you should be the opposite. Okay, so you should be walking like a tough guy, like this. And there's a history to it, there's no time to go into that. When the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ came, and then they came, and during the Ta'af, they, they were commanded, because the Quraysh and the Kuffar were watching them, because Makkah was in their control, and they were watching the Sahaba, and they, they were saying that these guys, they, they, uh, they went with Muhammad ﷺ, and they left our, our city, they left their home, they went to Medina, and uh, Medina... Uh, the flu of Medina and Medina has weakened them. They've become weakened. So in order uh, to, uh, to respond to that, they were commanded by the Prophet ﷺ and he showed them that they should be walking like warriors, tough guys. So because all eyes were set on them. The Kuffar were in control of Makkah. Makkah authorities, Kuffar, Quraysh, Abu Jahl and all these guys, they were watching them. So, so to give them the impression that no, we're as tough as we used to be before. And because Allah Ta'ala likes that so much, it's part of our ta'af until the day of judgment that we have to do that. Just as when you do this uh, sai between Safa and Marwa, because the, the running, frantic running of the mother of Ismail uh, alayhi salam, was so dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when she was running frantically for water, to find water for the baby Ismail alayhi salam, Allah Ta'ala loved it so much that he has made it part of our Hajj and Umrah. That at that point in your sai, you have to do it. Men have to do it. And women, due to reasons of hijab, parda, should not be running. But men, you will see, will be running between those uh, two uh, sets of green lights. So this act is called Ramal. In your ta'af, this is called Ramal. And it is a sunnah mu'akkada. Okay, it's a stressed, emphasized sunnah in any ta'af after which there is a sa'i. In any ta'af after which you are going to be doing a sa'i, you must do this ramal. If after your ta'af there's no sa'i between Safa and Marwa, there's no ramal. So when you later on after your umrah, when you're going to be doing nafal ta'afs, nafal ta'afs, there's no ramal. And obviously there's no ibtiba, exposing exposure of your right shoulder. Because during nafal tawaf, you do not need to be in a state of ihram, just to do tawaf. If it is too crowded, then walk normally, moving your shoulders until you find an opening to resume your fast pace. If it's too crowded, uh, nowadays it shouldn't be. If you get out of the crowd, 
Like if you get out of the crowd, there should be space. During peak season, Ramadan, and during the Hajj season, uh, if you have problems because the whole Mataf area is completely jammed by people, it's congested by people. But nowadays you shouldn't have any problems, you should get out of the crowd and although your, uh, your walk, your circuit will be much larger, uh, but you should be able to do everything properly. For the last four circuits, men, we're talking about men. So for the first three circuits of your uh, uh, tawaf for Umrah, you will do Ramal, as described just now, you'll be walking at, a, at, at briskly with heaved shoulders and chest, like a warrior, a tough guy. And then after the, you've done it for the third circuit, the, for the remaining four circuits, you'll do it at a normal, in a normal way. You don't do Ramal for the remaining four circuits of your seven circuits. Idtiba is another thing, two things you have to be mindful men during your ta'af for your umrah. Ramal, as described now, the second thing is idtiba that I mentioned briefly, that you wear your upper sheet of your ihram uh, sheets in this manner. And that image is showing you exactly what you need to do. Like, look, this guy, is, he isn't exposing his chest, is he? His breast is not exposed. It's just his shoulder is exposed. Okay? A lot of people just have the sheet hanging around, hanging. Uh, the, the whole side is exposed. That is all wrong. It's makru. You just do it like that. It's devised for men to cover their right shoulder by passing the upper sheet under their right arm. It's devised is sunnah mu'akkada. It's sunnah mu'akkada. It's uh, emphasized sunnah in all seven circuits of the ta'af after which there is a sa'i. If there is a sa'i between Safa and Marwa after this ta'af, in which case, in your case, which it is, then you must do it's devised for the full seven circuits. Your right shoulder should be left exposed for the seven circuits. So Ramal is for the first three circuits, walking like a tough guy, warrior. But if Tiba exposed, keeping your right shoulder exposed is for all seven circuits. After you've completed the seventh circuit, then you should now cover yourself properly. Men. So unlike Ramal, Iztiba is only done in Ihram. For Iztiba, obviously, you can't do Iztiba in a non-state of Ihram. Because you will not be wearing in a non-state of Ihram. If you're doing a Nafal Tawaf later, then you will not be wearing your Ihram sheets. You'll be in your normal Jubba, Kameh shirt, whatever you're wearing. Once the Tawaf is complete, cover the right shoulder, cover the shoulder again. It is Makuru to keep it uncovered. And women do not uncover any part of their body at any stage. Now you're going to be ending your ta'af. At the end of your seventh circuit, you do istilam again for the eighth time. Meaning, either physically go and uh, kiss the black stone. If you cannot do that, uh, then you should do istilam. You should gesture with your hand towards the, with your palms towards the stone, and then you kiss your hands. Facing, facing, facing the stone, the black stone, Hajar Aswad. Facing the black stone, the black stone is there in front of you. You raise your hands like this towards the stone, the palms towards the stone as if you're touching the stone because you can't physically get there due to the crowd and then you kiss your, your palms. This is Sunnah Mu'akkada. Your Tawaf is now complete and then you proceed, you go to the Zamzam to drink Zamzam water from the taps of the dispensers and you will perform two Wajib Rakat of Tawaf prayers. So remember Tawaf is Fard, it's one of the core, four core parts of your, of your Umrah after you performed your tawaf, to, you now need to pray two rakat of tawaf salah. Every time you perform tawaf, be it part of your umrah, be it part of a hajj, be it as a, a nafal tawaf in your normal uh, clothes, everyday clothes. If you've done tawaf seven times of the house of Allah, it is now wajib for you to pray two rakat salat of tawaf. Okay? These two rakat of salat uh, of tawaf, uh, you can pray anywhere. If possible, you, desirable, it is desirable that you pray it behind Maqam Ibrahim. Okay, uh, you will see a a glass enclosure, glass within which, if you can get to there, uh, which you should at this uh, quiet season, you will see there's a, a stone in there, and you will see the fo two uh, 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 footprints. There will be footprints in there of of two feet, a, a pair of feet. That stone is said to be the stone on which Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, stood when he was rebuilding the Kaaba by the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that stone used to extend as he put bricks upon bricks to rebuild the house. That stone used to stretch. It was flexibly stretched. That stone has been um, retained, preserved 
and that is now in a glass enclosure and that is near the house of Allah Ta'ala and that place is called the Maqam Ibrahim Ibrahim's station or the place of Ibrahim alayhi salam to pray your two rakat of tawaf salat after completion of your seven circuits it is mustahab to pray those two rakat behind Maqam Ibrahim you will notice there will always be a crowd of people there there will be crowds always trying to pray there or trying to touch it or to, to look at it you will zam- drink some zam- water and then you will perform your two wajib rakat of tawaf salat. The, there is a dua that is in the hadith uh, when drinking zamzam water. Uh, I think Sayyidina Abdul ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu used to say this dua when he used to drink zamzam water. So you will say this dua trying to learn this. Uh, this dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan wasi'an wa shifa'an min kulli da. Whenever you drink zamzam water, uh, you should try and say this dua. Even at home when someone gives you zamzam water, say this dua and then drink the water. It, it means, oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge, ample sustenance and the safeguard from every illness. So, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an, beneficial knowledge, wa rizqan wasi'an, a, a very... Um, Vast, wasi means vast risk, provision, sustenance, risk. I want vast sustenance from you, Allah. And shifa amin kulli da shifa, a cure from every form uh, of illness. It's a very good, beautiful dua, very brief, uh, very comprehensive. Try and learn this. Say this dua, Bismillah wa barakatillah, and you drink the zamzam water. The Zamzam water has a lot of uh, uh, blessings, a lot of virtues. Uh, some of those include the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, Zamzam water is for the purpose for which it is drunk. Ma'u zamzam lima shuribalahu. Zamzam water serves the purpose for which it is drunk. Whatever intention you want, have with, with, in drinking the water, inshallah, it will serve that, uh, that purpose or that intention. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi also said, meaning of a hadith, that zamzam water satisfies as food and cures illness. Abdul ibn Abbas radiallahu used to say the dua that I've just mentioned to you when he used to drink the water. You pray two rakat of tawa prayer behind or close to the maqam Ibrahim and these two rakat are wajib. They can be performed anywhere in the mataf or hatim or in the masjid or anywhere in Makkah Mukarram. You can even go back to your hotel and perform those two rakat. You do not have to perform them in these locations. You can perform them anywhere, even in your hotel. Men do not cover their heads for this prayer while in ihram. Because you're still in ihram, you cannot cover your head. Do not perform these two rakat in the makru time for prayer, uh, after Fajr or Asr Salat, but rather perform it after these times have passed. Okay, just with any other prayer, we do not pray. There are three times of the day we do, when we do not pray. Make sure your two rakat of wajib ta'af Salat is not performed during those um, prohibited times. Like you did with your two rakat of entering ihram Salat, it is desirable in the first rakat after Surah Al-Fatiha to recite Qul Ya Yul Kafirun and in the second rakat after Surah Al-Fatiha Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. After these two dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no rush, take your time. Those are images of the Maqam Ibrahim that I mentioned to you, this is what it looks like. First timers, uh, try, and get, uh, try and get a glimpse of it. You should be able to, it's not very busy now. Uh, and try and get close to it just to see. There's no blessing in touching the case. There's no blessing in kissing this or touching it. Or that you get no barakat. But just go and see it. Uh, inshallah, there's benefit in seeing it, but you will not get anything special by touching or kissing that uh, enclosure. So, some basic uh, rules of tawaf, quickly. All tawafs consist of seven circuits anti clockwise. And they must be around the Kaaba. And each set of ta'af contains eight istilam of the, of the black stone. The Kaaba should always be to your left. Ta'af is not valid if any part is done facing the Kaaba or with your right or back to it or going clockwise. Ta'af is valid within the boundaries of the masjid. If a person goes outside the masjid and does ta'af from outside the masjid, that ta'af is a no ta'af. It is not valid. It is valid inside the masjid. Wudu is required for all ta'afs. If your wudu breaks, leave and refresh it. Go and do your wudu and then return and continue from where you left off. A menstruating woman cannot make ta'af until becoming pure because it is not permitted for her to enter the masjid. A, a woman in that condition is not allowed to enter any masjid. So she will not be able to do ta'af. And also to do ta'af she needs to be in a state of wudu. A 
Although if someone did tawaf in that state, the tawaf is valid, but they have, they, they have committed a wrong. A menstruating woman cannot make tawaf until becoming pure because... Uh, okay, I've done that. Intention for tawaf does not need to be uttered aloud. You can say it to yourself in your mind or, or, or just say it to yourself quietly. Only talbiya is said aloud. Women should avoid ta'af in the middle of the mataf when it is very busy. This applies especially during Ramadan and during the Hajj season. Women should not be going onto the mataf area, the open area around the Kaaba, the open area, because during those two seasons, the Hajj season and during Ramadan, it is completely, absolutely packed. It is impossible, I've tried it, impossible for a person to do ta'af without physically coming into contact with the body of people all around him. Everyone is just completely cramped together. So it is not be permissible for a woman to get into that crowd and try and do ta'af there. She should get out and go onto the roof, onto the first floor, second floor, rooftop, and it will be easy. Although the circuit will be huge, it will take longer and a lot more energy, but she will be able to do it freely there. If you are doing ta'af and it, uh, it's time for salat, the prayer is about to begin with the imam. Then you must stop your ta'af and you should join the prayer in your place. Get to the saf. Women should go to where the women are. And you should then uh, pray. And after prayer, come back and resume, uh, resume the circuit that you were on. So get back to the black stone. So if you were on the fifth circuit of your ta'af, you were at some juncture, point of the, si- uh, the fifth circuit, for example, say in the middle or wherever, then go and pray. After prayer, come back and start from the beginning of that fifth circuit. Okay? Come to the black stone and begin from there. And not from the very spot from where you left. So if you say, I'm going to leave a marker with, the, with a uh, marker pen on the floor. And I'm going to come back and start from there. No, that, you should not do that. Go back to the black stone and carry on from there. If you have doubt about the number of circuits that you completed, then go with the least number. You're doubtful, you've forgotten, was that the fifth or the fourth one? You're saying the, it was the fifth one, your wife is saying, no, that was the fourth one when we stopped and went to pray. Then go with the fourth one. Okay, better safe than sorry. If you finish your ta'af, and after you finish your ta'af, and then your wife says, I think we did six, and you think it's seven, or you're on your own and your mind is playing games with you, just ignore that. That is waswasa. Just ignore it. It's waswasa. Shaitan is whispering that just to, to, to make you perishan. Okay. So j- just ignore that and you just carry on with the next things that you need to do. Beside the black stone and the Yamani corner, Ruknul Yamani, avoid touching the other corners of the house. Don't stop to touch any of the other corners. We're not commanded. There's no blessing in touching those corners thinking that there is any blessing. Only with the black stone and the Yemeni corner you should be touching uh, those corners. Also with the Yemeni corner you see people kissing it. There's, we're not, we should not be kissing the corner. It's just touching, no kissing. If you can get to the black stone, kissing. And as I said before, be careful with touching the walls of the Kaaba during the Ta'af in Ihram as they may be perfumed. They usually are perfumed. Okay, so during your in a state of Ihram, try not to touch the wall of the Kaaba because the perfume will come onto your hand. Same thing with the Ruknul Yamani. If it's perfumed, you should not be touching it because in a state of Ihram, you should not be, you should not have, you should not come into contact with or apply perfume to your body or your clothes. There is no particular zikr for ta'af except between the uh, Yemeni corner and black stone. You can read any dua you like or you can take dua books with you. For example, Al-Hizb Al-Azam is a very popular dua book or Munajat al is another dua book. You can take those dua books and you can read du'as from, the, du'as from the Quran and Sunnah during those times, during your ta'af as well as during Safa, the Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. That's the black stone. There's a history to the black stone there. That the black stone is not the whole thing is not the black stone. The black stone throughout uh, 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 various um, um, disturbances and various um, problems that we've had in the history of the ummah, the black stone has been lost. Much of it, most of it, is lost, and there are just uh, bits and pieces of it left, which are there now inside uh, in, inside that stone. It's uh, broken into pieces as a result of damage inflicted throughout the ages, such as fire, flood and removal by the Qaramita in 930 and returned in 951. They even removed it and then they returned it 20, 21 years later. The remaining pieces are cemented and held in that silver frame. 
are still remaining. That's a close-up of it. So uh, there's small pieces, fragments of the original black stone are still left, and they're put inside that case. The Multazam uh, is a special place that you do du'a. The Multazam basically is the, that part of the wall where that policeman is hanging, um, from between where the black stone is in the corner and the door. That part of the wall of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called the black stone. Okay, and Multazam is a place, one of the very special places where du'a is accepted. If a person does du'a, uh, doing iltizam. Iltizam means clinging. It's, it's when a person places their chest, their face, their forearms and their palms against the wall and makes du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in earnest. That is called uh, iltizam. So Multazam is from iltizam. Multazam means the place of iltizam. Okay, in Arabic, Multazam is the place of Iltizam. And Iltizam means to place these parts of your body against the wall and to cry to Allah Ta'ala, to do dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the ulama and the, the, the great saints of the uh, Mashaykh say that whatever dua they made to Allah Ta'ala on the Multazam, clinging to the Multazam, was accepted, answered by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That has been tried and tested throughout history. So if you can get yourself there, that's the best place to do dua in that manner. <coughs> Some more places where du'a is accepted, the matab, the multazam, these are some of the places where du'a is accepted. Um, now, the second thing that you need to do as part of your umrah is to do the sa'i between Safa and Marwa. Sa'i between. So now you've done uh, one of the main things. Out of the four things, ta'af was, one, was the main thing, you could say. The second main thing is the sa'i between Safa and Marwa. And then the third and fourth things are very simple, straightforward. So you've completed your ta'af. Now you do the second thing out of the four things which make up your Umrah, which is to do Sa'i bet between Mount Safa and Mount Marwa. Once upon a time they were like mountains. Over time, over the centuries, they've been diminished uh, and they've now become like small hillocks, like small hills. I'll show you some images, photos of what they look like now. Now you need to go for Sa'i. You should do, go and do a ninth Istilam of the black stone, uh, and then you shall now proceed towards the Safa. I will show you where Safa is. Um, if I can find it. Okay, if you look at this here, so that's where the black stone is, next to the door of the Kaaba. Can you see? And uh, Safa is this way. If you look from there, then you should see... Um, let's get another plan. Okay. That's where Safa is. And there's a dome on the roof of the masjid above Safa. The other thing is, um, there are various ways of finding Safa. Easy way is to look for the sign. If you walk towards that, in that direction from the Kaaba, you will see in English and in Arabic, Safa, written there with an arrow. Another thing you could do is you will see uh, soldiers or policemen or uh, employees of the masjid, you will, will, you will notice them, just ask them Safa. You don't need to, need, uh, need to know Arabic, just say the word Safa, they'll know, they do this all the time, and they'll point you where you need to go. When you get to there, you will know that this is Safa. You see people, you see a, a small hill, and you see people going up onto the top of the hill. You need to go there. And Marwa is at this end, at the opposite end. So Safa is there, and Mount Marwa is here, at the other end. Awesome. Right, so you're going to begin your Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. You will go and so after you've done your stilam of the black stone, you will proceed towards Safa. Locate Safa. It is sunnah to be in a state of wudu during Sa'i, but it is not obligatory. Unlike Ta'af, in which you have to be in a state of wudu for the full duration of your Ta'af, uh, uh, Sa'i without wudu is valid. But it is desirable that you be in a state of wudu for your Sa'i. But if you lose your wudu during your Sa'i, just continue and you can just complete it in a state of non wudu. You get onto Mount Safa, you make the intention for the Sa'i, 
You say, oh Allah, I, I am about to perform sa'i between Safa and Marwa to please you, make it easy for me and accept it from me. You can recite, if you know this, inna Safa wal Marwa tamin sha'airillah. You can recite, this is from the Qur'an, which I mentioned right at the beginning, that indeed Safa and Marwa are from the symbols of Allah. They are from the emblems of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's possible, then go to where you can see the Kaaba, and facing the Kaaba, raise your hands in supplication and do dua. It is possible, I'm not sure whether it's the case now, from, the, uh, from a point of Mount Safa, you can see the Kaaba, you look down. But when you get to Mount Marwa, you cannot see the Kaaba, because it's all walled. The, because of the wall of the Masjid, you can't see Mount Marwa. But, uh, Kaaba from Mount Marwa, but you should be able to locate the direction of it by looking down on the marble stones on the floor. They are all pointing towards the Kaaba. The stones on the floor, rectangular shape, shapes on the floor, are the shapes of Janamas, prayer mats. They, that's the shape and size of each of the, uh, the marble stones on the floor. And they're all pointing in the direction, precise direction of the Kaaba. So you, when you get to Mount Marwa, each time you get there, you can't see the Kaaba from there, but you will know the direction and you do raise your hands and do, do dua facing the Kaaba. You do dua. So you need to do dua every time when you are Every time you get to Mount Safa, every time you get to Mount Marwa during your sa'i, uh, you, should, you should do dua. You should do dua. It's not farz, it's not wajib, but it is desirable. That's what you're there for, to do as much dua as possible. You face the Kaaba and raising your hands, you will do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can say Allahu Akbar three times, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then you can say this dua, if you can learn it to take it with you. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu yuhyi wa yumit wa huwa hayyun la yamut bi adhi al-khair wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. If you know this kalima, say it and then you do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where the Safa area is now, nowadays. And uh, uh, parts of the, uh, on Mount Safa, uh, some of the original rocks of the mount are still intact there. But it used to be open before, uh, but nowadays uh, it's all now closed uh, because uh, of the damage that has been caused and they will lose whatever remains of the mount that will be lost uh, in the future. That's why they've now completely closed it off. So you can't actually get onto those rocks of Mount Safa, but you can see it, you can get next to it. As far as you get, as long as you get on to, onto the hill or to the sides of the hill, then that is fine. You don't have to get right to the top of the hill uh, each time. That's another image showing uh, Safa in the uh, glass enclosure. This is the, uh, the Sa'i area previously, before they expanded and widened it. This is how it used to be before, the Sa'i area, Mas'a. And then, this is after they did the, the expansion. It is a very wide area, but during the peak season, Hajj days, it gets completely packed. And it's also on, on several floors, not just the ground floor. Uh, they've also made a, a wheelchair area in the middle for people in wheelchairs to do the Sa'i in. Start by walking towards Marwa. From uh, uh, Safa, you walk towards Marwa. When men get to the area with the green lights, they should run. That is the valley, that is the valley floor. When the mother of Ismail salam, ran for water, Hajar ran, anha, was running for water. This, this is the location where it is believed she ran for water for, the baby, for her baby. Salam. So when men, when you get there, you will see that it is marked by green lights at either end. And you will see men running there. You have to run. If you're with your wife, make sure you say to your wife that I'm going to run from here. When I get to the other end where the other green set of green lights are, I will w wait for you against the wall. And then when she gets there walking, she will find you against the wall. Do that every time you get there. You, women should not be running in the green light area. When you, when you reach Marwa, you have completed one lap. That's one lap. From Mount Safa to Marwa is one. From Marwa back to Safa is two. From uh, Safa to Marwa is three. And so you do this until your seventh ends at Mount Marwa. At Mount Marwa, you face the Qibla and say, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. And then you do dua for whatever you want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you head towards Safa for your second lap. And then you do this repeatedly until you finish the seventh lap at Marwa. So you begin at Safa and your seventh lap should be ending at Marwa. Okay. That's the maths. 
Do this repeatedly until you finish the seventh flap at Marwa. It is mustahab to perform two rakats in the masjid if possible after completing the sa'i. After you did your ta'af, to perform two rakat of ta'af salah was what? Wajib. After you've completed your sa'i between Safa and Marwa, to perform two sal- rakat of salat is mustahab. If someone omits it, they don't pray it, then there's no guna, uh, there's no sin uh, involved. But you should try and pray this two rakat of salat. <laughs> mustahab, mustahab, two rakat of uh, uh, salat of sa'i. You can pray this in the masjid after uh, completing your sa'i. Okay, so that's your ta'af completed, and that's your, so you did your ihram, first fard, and then you did your ta'af, second fard, and then you've now completed your sa'i between Safa and Marwa, first wajib, and there's just one more thing left, the second wajib left, and then that's your complete, uh, umrah completed, which is now to either shave your head, halq, or to cut your hair. After you've done that, you are now a umrah haji. <laughs> right. Now you cut your hair You can get someone else to cut your hair Another person who is in your condition At that stage of their umrah Either your wife or your companion Your friend, your brother If they are also at that stage of their umrah Then you can all cut each other's hair Although he has not exited his, his ihram yet himself But he can cut your hair Provided that he himself or she herself Is at that stage of the umrah Meaning ihram Ta'af and Sa'i have been done And all that remains for him Is to cut or shave the hair Then he can do yours and you can do his Men generally go to the barbers There are barber shops outside You can go to the barber shop Give them whatever they uh, want from you 15, 20, 25 riyals And, yeah, and they, they do it for you Women should have their hair cut in privacy uh, In the hotel room And they should not be doing it in public uh, A lot of women uh, Previously I saw, they gather around uh, on Mount Marwa and they take their headscarves off and each of them are cutting their hairs. Uh, that is completely wrong. Right? So m- women should be doing it in privacy. The amount of hair that goes around the fingertip, which is approximately an inch, has to be cut from 25% of your hair. That's the minimum. That's the minimum. The hair that you have, in the case of a woman, she will take all her, her hair and from the end of the hair, at least a quarter of the hair that she, that she has at the back, that should be cut at least an inch. Okay, at least an inch. For men, the same rule will apply that at least a quarter of your hair or what normally would have been your hair, if you've lost your hair, then a quarter, 25% of the hair has got to be cut if you're cutting it uh, by at least an inch. If your hair, for men, if your hair is shorter than an inch already, you have short hair, then that means you cannot, you cannot do uh, taqseed, you cannot cut your hair, you have no choice but to shave your head. The other thing is that the Prophet wasallam did dua for the... I'll carry on. The Prophet wasallam did dua three times for the, peop- for the men who shaved their head. Three times for the men who shaved their head. And he still did dua once for the men who cut their hair. So there's more reward if you shave your head. So that is the, the cutting of the hair. Uh, for men, it is more rewardable that they shave their head. And bear in mind, you must always remember what you're there for. You've gone there to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to gain the maximum benefit of being there. So don't worry about your hairstyle. Just get your hair, head shaved and then um, inshallah your hair will grow again. If someone has long hair, a man has long hair and he, does, he prefers for whatever reason not to shave his head, then he must do this. Like a woman, he has to have 25% of his hair or what normally would have been his hair, if he has lost hair, 25% of that total hair has got to be cut by a minimum of one inch. If it's not long enough, then he, he has no choice but to shave it. Women should do that. They should hold all the hair towards the back, gather it in a plate towards the back, and then uh, they should make a good estimate, and one quarter of the strands of hair should be cut by an inch. That's the minimum we're talking about, the minimum. Obviously, a woman will try and level the hair at the back. It is sooner for men to shave all their hair, otherwise they may trim or shorten their hair. 
After cutting the hair, uh, Umrah is complete and the restrictions of Ihram are now lifted. You, you have now completed your Umrah, you, are not, you have now exited your Ihram, there's nothing haram for you which is normally not haram. You seek for forgiveness from any shortcomings and thank Allah Ta'ala for providing you the opportunity to perform Umrah. And for the remaining days in Makkah Mukarrama, spend the days uh, doing nafal ta'afs. For a nafal ta'af, you just need to make the intention start from the black stone uh, as you did during your umrah. Do seven circuits in the same way, but there's no ramal, there will be no istiba'. Okay, there's no ramal for the first three circuits. Uh, heaved up chest and shoulders like a warrior, you don't do that because there's no sai after it. And there's also no iztiba exposure, keeping your right shoulder exposed because you're not in a state of ihram. So nafal tawaf, you do like that, seven circuits. Afterwards, you still have to pray the two rakat of tawaf salat. For those who are not local people of Makkah, Mukarrama, all of you, for you it is more rewardable each time you enter the masjid, al-masjid al-haram, to perform nafal tawaf rather than engage in nafal salat. If you can't do that and try and do it, it will, be, it will take a long time. Uh, but it is more rewardable. Try and do as many nafal tawafs as possible. Another question is that, is, is uh, multiple umrahs permissible in a single journey? In one suffer, in one journey, are you allowed to do more than one umrah? The answer is yes. There's nothing wrong. Rather, you should try and do as many umrahs as possible. Once you've completed your own umrah, when you get, you've done your own umrah, then try and do umrah for your parents, your grandparents, for other people, for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for great ulama and mashaykh of the past. You can name them, you can do an umrah for Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahmatullahi alayhi, Nizamuddin Chishti, Shajillah, rahmatullahi and so on. You can do umrah for any person. Even you can do, you can perform any good deed on behalf of even a living person, according to our madhab. Okay? There's nothing wrong in that. If anyone says it's a bid'ah or whatever, just ignore them. Don't engage in arguments. A brother recently came back from Umrah about two weeks ago and he said that some people were arguing with him in the group saying that you're not allowed to do more than one Umrah on one journey. It's a bid'ah uh, and so on. Just ignore them. Don't engage in debates. Yeah.